Welcome everyone um, to developing an integrated collection cataloging management system. Um, I know I was going to put this on, won't he? Um, I'm Jane Alexander, and I'm the Director of Information Management Systems and Technology Services at Cleveland Museum of Art. And um, this is Andrea Bohr, and she is Collection Management Analyst. Which Collections Information, Information Data Analyst. Okay, you'll have to talk about it. Um, so when we, back in April, we've been working on this for the last, uh, well, you could say longer than the last two years, but the last two years uh, we um, decided to take on this project of building it in, building our, a custom solution. And um, we was originally scheduled at this point, we were going to show you this fabulous system. But we had some other projects going on at the museum that are all sort of data driven. So I'm going to just rush you through what's going on that we're working on. That's um, because it sort of relates to how we changed gears. So um, we're currently um, working on a few really amazing projects. And one is Gallery One that opens in December in a month. And there's 15 different interactives. And um, there's an iPad app. And um, the last, the biggest part is this collection wall. And so I thought I'd just give you a little idea of what this is. But this is actually is going to be a 40 foot micro tile wall. And our entire collection on view will come up and it's multi touched. And you will be able to, um, by touching on any object, you will then have a cover flow and be able to sort of explore through either the collection or the medium. And then um, from that, you can save this to your iPad and make your own tour. And as you can see, what it's showing right now is every 30 seconds, a theme of our collection will come up. So this is horizons. And then we could have funny hats, or we could have gold. But in between each theme, the entire collection comes back again. Um, it's set up for people to view. We have couches and everything in this room that you can sit and just watch the collection and sort of understand our collection in new ways. Or you can interact with it um, as you saw. As you see those portals, that's where you just will drop your iPad. There'll be a wireless RFID reader and you can save things to that. Um, this is just sort of giving you another look at it. But this project has been going on for the last two years also. So. Um, how um, our collection cataloging management system works and, and how it dynamically feeds to our iPad and to our wall was definitely going to be important. So um, this is just giving you an idea. This is showing again slows. Uh, but also how it relates to our iPad. Our iPad, every single object on view, we set it up in multiple ways, take a tour, or we have a near you now based on the objects that you liked at the collection wall. Oops. Objects that you liked at the collection wall, you could um, sort of favorite and have a playlist. And then through wayfinding, I don't know why this is going out. This is frustrating. Um, through wayfinding, you would then go find the object. You would then have information about this is all, this another part. You could scan all the objects that are interpreted. Um, and you could get information after you scan it there would also be information and additional assets every object that's interpreted is in the top and then there's related if you like this here are other objects you might like and then you would just wander through the museum that way but as you can imagine it also this is also showing that it's all the social media and the content we're using for that as you can imagine um, Having to have this information dynamic is extremely important because something goes on loan, something goes to conservation. We don't want to, we want it immediately taken off just by the same systems we use in our management system. So um, then we also, at the same time, we uh, had a new site roll, our website roll out two years ago, but we are now changing the whole back end to Drupal. We took this time to also look at our search mechanisms and our design of our online collection. So we've redone that and we're designing that. And the same thing, the same 
um, tool sets we're using with our CCMS and how it integrates with our digital asset management system. Again, we wanted it seamless. With all these projects going on, we wanted when you make one change, it works everywhere. Um, and so that's sort of just to give you an idea of some of the stuff we were working on. So going back to this um, developing an integrated collection cataloging and management system, this is where it gets a, a little bit drier. <laughs> <laughs> Although we all love data. so we, But um, while doing these projects, you can imagine, well, as we were building the system, we started to realize, wait, we should have it do this. And what, what are other projects coming down the road? And so um, here, do you see F4? You have to do that for it. So no, it's good. All right. So um, here um, we, we are um, also at the same time. The museum is going through a three hundred fifty million dollar renovation. So. Um, there's lots going on that affects lots of different items, and so we were just giving an idea of the music here. You can scroll through that. These are probably the last amount of visuals you're going to see, so <laughs> we just threw this in. <laughs> um, but when, you, when the museum um, was going through this renovation, we had to close down, we had to move objects, and the importance of object movement um, became vital to half the staff in the museum and how they do their job. And at the same time, um, we had a custom-made system that was about 15 years old, and they realized we need to get a new system and we need to get it fast. And that was in 2008, 9, about this. So they had a committee come together, and they were tasked in evaluating um, off-the-shelf products, and they came down to two vendors, and it was passionately split. We had the cataloging, the library people, the curators, you know, this is the group we're going with, and then we had um, sort of collection management, conservation, going with the other, um, and people in between, but people were very strong about it. So at the time, they didn't have it, they had an acting director of IMTS, and they said, well, the direct, and they had an uh, interim director for the museum for a year, and uh, she had, uh, was, um, she decided that we were going to wait to hire the director of IMTS, and then we would have a decision that would make sense. So um, then I was hired. I was really excited. This is my dream job. I was very excited to start. And even before I got in the door, they said, OK, but you have to like decide on this product right away. But then the next day, they said, but before you do that, we're building this whole building, and all the infrastructure has to, we have to make that decision yesterday. And Gallery One, we don't, it was called something else at the time. We're not quite sure where we're going with this. So, um, and we realized it's opening September 2012. So, um, actually make that the priority. And all our website's going live in a month, and we don't have the collection online. We didn't figure out how we were going to do that. <laughs> and that date can change. Um, so, get, you know, that, and that was like running out the door with those projects. So, we had to sort of deal with the, um, website first and um, since that was going um, that you know so working with our digital asset management system and how to make that work and then at the same time we re we went a different way with collect with gallery one which you guys got to look at which is pretty fantastic and amazing and um, the infrastructure of the museum was going on we had to make decisions for the boardroom for all the AV through our performance centers and all the Wi-Fi and all the wayfinding we were going to use in some of these I, um, applications we were building. So um, that sort of, so um, the, what, why don't you say, you can, why don't you say what? Oh, so um, I looked at the CMS project and um, I told you the committee was strongly divided. I then said, um, well, what does this product do and what does this product do? And when I realized there's no one really knew, they just had sort of passionately gone with a group. And then I said, well, let me just see the needs assessment of what you guys needed to do. And there had been no needs assessment. And um, 
So, and everyone was really upset that for two years they had tried to figure out what company and they didn't really know it. They just knew they, it had to do what they needed it to do. So I disbanded the committee and said we're going to reconvene in a couple of months because we have these other priorities. Um, and then at the same time, I hired some consultants to formalize the process of reviewing and documenting the needs and the workflow analysis. And, um, and Andrea was one of the, Andrea had worked at the museum um, before that for about 15 years. And she had left to go uh, work at a university. And um, she had sort of introduced herself to me. And she had worked in the collection management system. And she had been on that committee that was disbanded. And so she helped sort of with another consultant put together information for what the museum really needed. And so our finding was, and this we put in highlighted, was a robust cataloging we found that robust cataloging extends beyond the structured tombstone record and catalog content is dynamically built through the business processes processes of each department. Um, so uh, we also then decided to make a new committee with a new name, the name, you know, because everyone was like, it's really not a collection thing, it's really, but so it's a collection, cataloging, and management system. And um, we had two representatives from all the departments that are noted there and um, the chief curator sort of led, would lead the committee. Um, and they came up with a charge, which was to articulate and correct, create a best-in-class collection management solution that accommodated the process of creating, preserving, and publishing information about artworks under consideration by our management of the Cleveland Museum of Art. And that took like three meetings, of course, to finally all agree that that was the charge. Um, and thus, at the same time, the consultants came back. Um, and this was really interesting for me because I had come from um, uh, private industry and also academic. Um, I had worked at top universities. And this was the life cycle of an object from accession to deaccession, every possible place this object could go. And so they put together this report. And then Andre is going to give you a little what they Came, what came out of that? So this ended up being the uh, visualization that uh, we we came to uh, after meeting with all of those stakeholder departments. Um, in fact, almost every department in the museum that has anything to do with collections care. We did not meet with development. That was outside of the scope of what we were asked to analyze. But there is can be a case made for that as well uh, in terms of donorship and keeping those records in sync when you're talking about you know, there's always a question of the development side and the <clears throat> donors to financial donors and um, and donors of art, works of art. We haven't synchronized that, and that wasn't in the scope of what we were looking at. But what we really wanted to make sure that we understood is if these systems that are off the shelf don't meet the need, what exactly is the need? What is the business of a museum in in terms of collections care? Because once again, Anywhere where there's a, a bottom line dollar, you have an efficient system, usually. Development systems, ticketing systems, these things work. Everybody knows exactly how they're supposed to work. With collections management, it's often very idiosyncratic. It, it may have to do with just who's in power or how things are structured. And so we were very careful to say, in any case, for any museum, what are the processes that you do? Not you guys, not how you do work. How should it be done? So uh, we came up with four phases. Uh, the first phase being the curatorial envisioning of uh, accessioning or ex exhibiting or in some other way. Um, we came up with the word yearning. It has anything to do. It's their curiosity uh, and their development in terms of how they want the catalog to grow. And there is a workflow there, and that would be creating a catalog record for whatever reason, research purposes, for inclusion in exhibition, for acquisition, for loan. The next phase was recommend. They will get to a stage where they will say, OK, this is beyond my yearning now. I do want to acquire this, or I want to bring it on site, or I do want to exhibit it. Um, now we have to actually start some more formalized processes of looking at what these catalog records are and, and actually taking action on them outside of the curatorial and conservation realms. Um, so you're going to get start getting things here that go through the entire accessioning process, including shipping, receiving, conservation review, photography, art movement storage, now all of a sudden you are in a very operational phase of uh, work of art in the collection. And these are sort of the gears grinding. Post-succession, photography, rights and reproduction, the shipping and receiving. 
Well, one interesting thing that we did when we were doing these analyses is we got narratives. We collected narratives from all the departments. It was comfortable for them. All these narratives were interpreted into workflows. And it was very interesting to have these people then see their narrative interpreted this way because the first thing we always heard was, but my work isn't linear. I, do, I can go around in circles for days. And they started to realize after a while that the workflows do in fact accommodate that, but there is always a logical if this, then this, take the next step in this process or step out of the process and step into another one. And I think one of the best things was seeing how their work interrelates visually with other departments. They would see it coming and going out of their, out of their world, into another world, back into their world, and what was happening in the meantime. So this was a very good education process for the staff to really get out of their silos and understand what each, each of them were doing. And actually, just to say, um, the, the committee that everyone who had been really upset actually started to really, everyone read all these workflows which, and were really detailed, corrected them all, and got excited about the process again. Like they really began to understand Stan, what everybody does and how it relates to what they do. Uh, we define the third phase as research and care. This means we've, we've gotten through recommendation. Now we actually are exhibiting it. We are, we are installing it. We're preserving it. We're doing everything that a museum does um, and expanding knowledge and, and growing the catalog in different ways. So now you might start involving education and the library. Though they are involved in the pre-accession process, now they're sort of becoming the, the more major players in terms of how are we, what is the interpretation of the work of art. So we had exhibition planning here, loans, design and installation, like I said, education and library. And then final phase, which not every artwork gets to. Um, so that's why I had a little problem with the circle <laughs> when we were talking about it. It doesn't, it's not really linear, but um, the decision is made and we have been, um, we have been in a process of deaccessioning some parts of our collection uh, over the years just in terms of storage space and expense and putting things out on the, you know, out on the market that can be shown somewhere better than, than in our institution. So um, it's actually kind of a complex process and it, any record that has been pushed out to all of these places that you, you know, collections online, the iPad app has to then be completely taken back out of them. So deaccessioning is actually a bigger deal um, when you start sharing all the information about your collection than you might have thought given that, not that it happens that frequently, but if it does, you certainly don't want to be reporting that something's in your collection anymore that is not. One thing we found was conservation had felt a little disenfranchised. Um, they have, there were issues uh, as, of being considered technicians as opposed to part of the uh, information and interpretation process. So they, were, they got very involved in writing their narratives and looking through their workflows and saying, no, really, we are involved with every phase. We are involved with the accessioning process. We are involved with the exhibitions process. We need way more information than we're getting way earlier than we're getting it. At the same time, everybody else was saying, we want conservation information. And that is still a sticky wick because conservation doesn't always want to share. So we are talking about people looking at collaboration and learning a lot about what they can and can't say or should or shouldn't say or know about each other's work. Um, Not to mention they needed a repository for all the images they take on their own that aren't object, official object images, but all the work that they do and ways that they, where they were keeping it and how, all the reports they write. And, and this is, their uh, conservation data <coughs> traditionally is not, does not have a whole lot of structure, at least ours didn't. We had reports and we, they were text documents and they were uh, copied into our old database. Um, this whole project has made them look at their information in a lot more structured way. How can they use a tool to, for discovery, for research, uh, without going overboard because they can tend to get almost too detailed, like a scientific report. So we always have to remind them, but why do you want to record it this way? It, what do you get out of it? What is the benefit? So to, to kind of make sure that the, the system or the requirements were, would suit what they needed and get them where they needed to go for their research and discovery um, and reporting and responsibility in terms of preservation, uh, but not get uh, analysis paralysis, I think it would be the best way to say. Uh, and once again, there's another workflow and they got really involved in this, looking at their processes. We have about 30 of these workflows. We're gonna go through each one in detail. <laughs> <laughs> End of the day, I think we ended up with a, some hundred page, I can't even remember exactly how many pages this business analysis document 
blended, but it did have about 20 workflows in it, maybe. Um, and that uh, was turned into about 105 use cases that, that would be technically implementable. So a lot of the things when we were doing business analysis, a, a database just can't help them do. You know, the, it's just not a tool for a lot of the things we were being told, but this is what we do when we went, well, the database isn't a place to do it. Uh, but 105 places that we could see, you could step through and have a piece of technology possibly help you get through and record what, what it is you're doing with your work. And then we, things came up that also, I mean, in those processes that we that other people didn't really understand and um, even conservation being able to recommend where they put the recommendations for how to pack something. I mean, normally just went in this sort of note in the uh, current collection management system, but that sort of there'd be an alert if that had changed and so that they could review it so that, I mean, there was there was this whole idea that we really do need, there are processes that, that have to go back and forth sometimes until a solution is made. Um, so uh, we, after looking at, um, the committee looked at the life cycle of an object and the use cases and they came up, um, the uh, consultants came up back with software requirements for our institution and one was that it had to be browser based. I mean that was going to be huge, especially um, because going into the a lot again half of our collection was still in storage and how we were going and getting things and looking at them and um, we want we knew that we would have to be mobile with that um, and people are all over, traveling all over the world and this whole idea of dialing into our system was not working um, applications and data maintained in-house standard programming language standard and open architecture standard framework for cataloging works or arts with the ability to assign authority controls to applicable data fields and so these were, then we realized these were the solutions we couldn't find in, at the time in current um, off the shelf um, products. So um, one was the seamless inter integration with um, CMA. Well, of course, with CMA stand, but you know, that really your digital asset management system, your catalog was just one login, one, and you're, you're on your way to anything you needed. Um, why don't you talk about the other two, sir? Okay. Uh, at, the, at the time, and I made no comment about what's available now because this project is, you know, two years old, uh, the service request system that we had customized into our current system, which was doing a, a dynamic inventory control already. So um, from the point of I need to, a curator saying I need to request photography, literally all they would have to do is put in a photography request that said this image, this object, and I need it by this date or I need it after this date. Um, that request would flow through all the, that, that analysis had already been done, flow through to the art handlers and the photography studio. They were all able to lo log into the system that we had, pull up work orders, schedule them, move the art, and the art inventory control, which was going out to collections online and has for the past five years, always has, um, was dynamically updating the location of the object on view, not on view. Um, and if it was in a gallery that was open to the public, what gallery it was in. But that was always an important thing. Uh, inventory control is a huge, huge issue with the Cleveland Museum of Art. Because of this move, we were moving artwork from galleries that were on view to galleries that were closed and turned into storage spaces so that we could tear down the building in between the two buildings. And this building project physically has been five to ten years of constantly moving the artwork around. It could not, this was something that could not be lost, the inventory control, the ability to request these things to move, take action on them, conserve them, install them. Um, too much action was, be, was going on and that was, a, a, that was some functionality that we could not lose and we could not find. Um, the other thing that came out of the business analysis more was document management, that we have in fact quite a bit of unstructured data that can support a lot of interpretation and that all those file folders were sort of lost and you had to know the right person to get to the file folder and um, it became pretty clear that everybody got very excited about this concept that with federated searching in if all these things are scanned and in a database the curator takes their file and puts it in if they have the right security and access roles they will be able to um, expose or share uh, you know share all this rich information that is not really, really easily uh, retrievable at this time in this new system. So uh, we started to look more uh, more as a document management system than we thought we would uh, because we knew we needed cataloging, we knew we needed collections or 
transaction management, but this document management really started to take off when we started to look at what was being stored around, not to mention the fact that there's always issues of server space. Okay. Um, so then the question was, um, do we want to be in the business of developing software? And um, we went back to those two products, and it was not doing it, it, nearly 70% of what we needed it to do. So we thought, well, there's still, there's some big players out there. Maybe we'll put together an RFP and um, ask, you know, and say, you know, look at your system and um, and to the actually even to the two that we had been final finalists the two years before. And we also sent it out to just develop, you know, developers that work in making new projects and thought we'll see what we can do. We decided this because they we acknowledged as a committee that this was the core function of the museum and however there was no solution that we could actually live with at the time. Although we were dying with every other project going on, I kept thinking, isn't there something out there we can buy, you know, and we just couldn't find it at the time for what now now that we had all gotten invested in what we really wanted to do, no one wanted to, you know, we had to have at least eighty percent of what we wanted. Um, can you mention who your finalists were? Um, well, I don't know. It doesn't really matter at this point. <laughs> but I mean, but they were all major players, and we went back to everybody. We did. I mean, we we came. I went to museums on the web in 2011, and said, "I'm doing this RFP. You know, we're finishing this. We we're we're going to be finished in the next couple of months. This analysis, and would you be interested in?" Custom, you know, looking at your system and, and making a product that I'm sure you could resell to a lot of museums. And um, they all said they were interested, and we sent an RFP out. Um, I think most said they were interested. I don't know if anyone did. Um, and then also at the same time, now that I've been at where all the projects we were doing were application based, and um, we didn't have an application department, we didn't even have a program in the department. So I restructured. Um, we have, we're, I'm in charge of technical services, media services. But we added a whole application department um, because uh, libraries dealt with tons of applications, um, uh, the business processes of the entire museum, uh, our website and everything. We needed some, a programmer on site, especially if we were going to go to a lot of open source um, um, back ends. And then um, Andrea's position I created, which um, became uh, more collection data for all the projects we were working on. And the first job being you're going to help um, sort of project manage and be help us build this new project with a new vendor. And then the most exciting part was that all these projects I kept working with our chief deputy, the chief curator and deputy director. And um, when I first started, I reported to the interim director of the entire museum, who said, honestly, I'm not. I don't. I know technology is important, but I know nothing about it. And um, every time I was meeting with curators and conservation and education who all report to the chief curator, I felt sort of on the outside that he didn't really know what, why we had to do certain things. So we got, he actually really understood what we were doing and now I report to him directly, which is huge for um, the stuff we're trying to complete. So um, we think that that was a huge part of going forward. Um, and I already said this, um, that we came to the point that cataloging and business processes must work together in a single application. And we hired a developer in 2000, December 2011 with a really fast timeline, because we had done all that needs assessment and all the workflows. And when we talked to developers during the process, they were like, yeah, I could build it now, you know, um, knowing that things were going to come up. But that was sort of like, we're having these huge projects. We have Gallery One opening 2012. We want this finished by you know, end of September, because we like to implement that system with what we're doing. Um, so that was sort of, um, you can, so why don't, you can go through that. This is uh, probably, this was just part of the deliverables. We, we did definitely want to be development partners. We promised the committee if we were going to get to a point of, of doing a custom development project that they would be constantly involved, constantly updated. Um, as to what's going on uh, and involved in the decision making of this of this product because we as an IT group didn't feel like you know we can't represent every single need and they had been so involved in the process they really needed to make sure that this was working for them as they went along so this sort of just covers the issue right. of how are we going to be a partner in the development of this here's our technical infrastructure if you're curious we can go back to that one 
Uh, but one thing that did come out, and I, uh, we said this fairly early, if we're going to do this, we need to have a data governance committee. Um, it is too difficult, I shouldn't say it's difficult, but uh, once again, we had the issue of silos. And um, uh, when you're saying we're gonna have a collaborative shared database, that's going to allow a workflow, for instance, a catalog record to start in one department, be edited in that department, go through an approval chain, be used by another department, then go directly out to the web. That wasn't really the paradigm we had in place. So we had big, we had quite a paradigm shift where we were starting our catalog records in collections management, which we realized from the life cycle is not really where they start. They actually start in curatorial. Uh, but then obviously there's always information, uh, uh, issues of information control, and so we had to come up with rules for when can, change, when can you change a record? What's the impact of changing or updating a record? Who needs to know? How does the data flow through these things? That once again, IT can't make those decisions. The data governance committee was convened to work on these things. So we, needed, we knew we needed to analyze how we do business. It was going to change a bit with the shared database. Um, that one, and then we also definitely wanted to have, if we're developing our own piece of software, the, what, what are the rules for, you know, what is the direction, and they and have a committee that would support any, any would have, would agree to the decisions that were being made. Same group of players, except for this time, it's all the directors. Um, these are direct reports to the deputy director. Everybody involved uh, comes into a room, we make decisions, they can't argue with it because there's minutes. Uh, once again, what we were talking about, what we asked them to do. Some of the things we talked about early on uh, was how to manage whole and part records. Obviously, a database can do that. A hierarchy is not a problem. Uh, but the fact of the matter is when you're talking about a, a piece of artwork that's inventoried as 10 pieces but wants to show on the app as one, how do you title it? How do you, who makes the decision about how to title it? Who makes a decision to, to join these records into a grouping? And we found actually that within the last two weeks, interpretation sometimes groups things outside of the way curatorial would group them. So we have a lot of issues in terms of uh, how can we publish? Because this kept getting back to what we want to do is access to our collection. And we don't want to publish it at the inventory level that we want to know where it is, we want to publish it at the interpretation level. So allowing various levels for whole and part records and how we can do that and setting rules on them so we don't have an unholy mess uh, is one of the things that data governance is talking about. Another issue that we had was conservation would have loved to have gone to the subatomic level with cataloging. They would say, well, if we can keep going in, we'll go all the way down to, you know, I, and I say that with most respect for how much information they can provide. But at some point we had to say, we're not gonna try to catalog and keep track of inventory of um, these parts that are inextricably attached to each other, even if they're entirely different from a conservation or uh, material standpoint. And then there was how to manage the catalog change approvals. Once again, I brought up that issue with, with the distributed cataloging system in place People couldn't just change things without other people knowing. So we definitely wanted audit trail. We wanted approvals on that. Uh, we've worked into that. And that's just a little graphic as to how this is being implemented. We have on this database, we have this concept of a sandbox record, which means that records get checked out. Um, there, there's the main record, the primary record, which is used operationally. It's the, it's the piece, the, it's the work of art. The record that moves, it gets shipped, gets put on loans and exhibitions. If the curator has checked out that record to do some curatorial work in terms of updating titles, dates, materials, uh, that record has spawned itself a copy, is sitting in their sandbox until they inject it back into the workflow. It goes through approval when it has gone through the two stages of approval that it needs to. It then becomes the primary record. The primary record is archived. Um, and then all the other operational checklists or anything else that's using it has the option to be refreshed. So you definitely, if it's art movement, you're going to want to use the, the new data. But if it's an exhibition, you possibly want to keep the exhibition title the way it was. So we definitely needed to have this sort of asynchronicity of cataloging from these operational things. Though we needed them to work together, you can't be changing other people's work when they're in the middle of it without some sort of notification system in place. 
The other initiative that came up was uh, uh, for, once again, for these walls collections online, people realized that the curators have to take ownership of their collections, the information about their collections. None of these projects work if the curator doesn't catalog or say a bare minimum. Provide content. <laughs> <laughs> Provide content. I mean, the basic tombstone. What, what is it the curators will guarantee? We as IT can't support these projects if we don't know what the curators will say for sure. So the curators actually convened their own committee, decided what is it is their bare minimum responsibility that all of them have to commit to say about the works in their collection, which means we then all have a roadmap to say, when somebody comes up with a, an idea, well, can we put this on the wall this way? Well, yep, it's part of their core data, so that type of information can be exposed and it is guaranteed to be there. Uh, they, so they set their universal categories that they all curators and all disciplines have to do, and then they even went further to say, you know, for these particular collections, we also need to say this. So an African collection is going to have a different requirement, perhaps, than Egyptian in terms of extra fields of data. And then this is uh, collaboration. Collaboration. <laughs> we felt like you needed another visual. So. <laughs> <laughs> we just, but um, it, it did become a sense of here, collaboration. I'll go. This is collaboration. This is our designer and a curator and an art handler, and obviously, they're all working together. <laughs> so the question is, you know, these were questions. What tools do we need for effective and efficient institutional collaboration? If we are going to work together and share a database, how just, will it work? What tool will, will the, will the um, how can the tool encourage shared knowledge and use? We're sharing information where we sometimes hid it from each before. Um, can the analysis process educate the stakeholders about their interdependencies? We've already talked about that with the workflows. And the, can the solution provide both the transparency and the protection required uh, for various parts of information in the database? So what is this system going to do? Support internal and external research, support data related to the business process, support detailed conservation cataloging, provide a shared document workspace, particularly for exhibitions. We have a lot of versioning issues with exhibitions information, uh, and integrate fully with our Piction Dam. So we were off building, and um, uh, we are way into the process of it, and so we just thought we'd touch on some highlighted features. I'll let you, you can. So again, I think I've covered on some of these things. We are talking about every single documentary piece of information that gets produced in the life cycle of an object being attached in a logical way to these various records, be they the catalog record, the creator record, the shipping record, every single record can have documents attached to it and, and the even, document structure. Right, and this, is, this became like a big talking point with everybody we were working with, especially when you're putting together an exhibition, but even um, the, we were talking with the new chief um, conservation conservator, he said that um, he wanted to have all the emails about a certain object that that museum might acquire, you know, set aside that people could see it. And he had this whole sort of idea of how he wanted to do that. And we thought, no, in our new CCMS system, this is something that, you know, would follow the life cycle, would follow the life of this object if it did get accessioned. So that's bringing up a whole yeah. bunch of issues of document management that we, we don't, it's, and it's not document management in the typical archival way. This is document management because we need to be able to retrieve them in a logical way. It's part of research and discovery. So we are learning a lot about what we might want to do with things that are in file folders right now or in email folders or anywhere around the building and working with our archives uh, department expertise with that. <coughs> Workflows. These are the vendor created words, the sequential and state machine workflows. But once again, because we're talking about approval processes for catalog changes and, and approval processes for exhibitions and pretty much everything you do on the system, we can assign a workflow to, uh, but we don't have to. <laughs> Uh, and some new notifications and rollbacks and every all of these things that we sort of need to manage information not on a piece of paper and in an email but in a shared collaborative space obviously we alerts. can get alerts about everything <laughs> and you can opt out of any alerts that was sort of the thing that some people wanted to know every single time someone changed the type of tape they were going to use for packing, they wanted to get an alert. The other person only needed to get an alert if there was something major done to this tombstone information. 
And this was something that got the committee very excited was these meeting workspace. Once again, we create a lot of agendas. We have a lot of meetings about loans. We have a lot of meetings about accessions, uh, and we exhibitions, and we tend to put them all in spreadsheets and share them and write over them and then forget which one is the most current one. The promise of this is that they're always looking at the same meeting and the same meeting agenda in a shared space, and should anybody change that information, they will have immediate access to it and not have it attached to an email and forgotten in some other file folder. So that is uh, that was another very exciting feature that they they were hoping would um, it, it would hoping help do their, help do their work. We expect database integration, seamless integration with the Piction Dam, um, a single portal. We expect that the images will flow and the metadata will flow back and forth between the two systems. We do not expect this solution to be a dam, but we expect it to talk to it perfectly. Here's a, here's a visual. <laughs> Anybody who's curious about these technical things? So, um, oh, no, I'll show you. Yeah. We're working on UI right now, so a lot of this structure is in place. We didn't want to show you live because it's not completely finalized right now. This is the direction we're heading in terms of what an edit page might look like for the, for the system. You can see in the middle your standard catalog. You can see some navigation on the left, and you can see functionality even further out to the left. Uh, so we can edit objects, we can request things like photography and conservation. Um, you can see that you fill out the form specific information at the top, attach objects in the bottom, and you have a constant, you constantly can see exactly what's going on in terms of that request. Uh, expect notices, this is a new thing where the curator can assign objects, um, send a direct request through the system uh, to get approved by the chief curator. Uh, <coughs> That to agree that in fact an object can come into the collection and this is what the registrar gets a nice list this is my work list without any paper passing anywhere we have we have the electronics signed through the whole entire workflow of, of you know what could be paper passed around is all done on the system and this is just a quick glam glimpse of what the search results look like right now we have not integrated yet so you see blue boxes where we will have images in the future What's done? Well, we got all our data out in the cloud on a server farm from our current system. Uh, and they can converted our, debt ca our current catalog to a CDWA compliant architecture. I've done the data conversion review. That went very well. Uh, they, they have proposed page designs. Um, it does work perfectly fine on any browser. I've tried it in about four different ones. Uh, the workflows are in place for cataloging and editing and all those related approvals. The workflows for requesting photography conservation are all established. We did user testing for catalog entry and those workflows. Uh, and the technical specifications are uh, in place now for exhibitions and loans. And that is the next module they're going to build. So what do we have left? They have to implement the UI design. We have to develop the exhibitions module. We need to integrate with the DAM. Well, that's in process. All these things are in, in process. process. Uh, site construction being one of the other things is that you can customize your interface because, once again, this is a pretty big database. Um, you don't want to be, if you're in African art, looking at a bunch of fields or a bunch of data that really has nothing to do with your collection curatorially. Um, so these custom interfaces for the user type or user role group, we haven't quite decided how we're going to build these, but the um, the development platform allows for this custom site construction and the document management portion. So um, we were humming along, as I said, and, trying, and pushing really quickly to get this done by uh, September. And then the, we were also working on these other projects. I mean, Andre had pretty much nothing even to do with Gallery One for most of the time. And then all of a sudden, the amount of content and data and stuff that we were doing to build this other project in the 15 interactives not you know besides the wall and the iPad to get this all done with San Marcellus, we um, started had to start using our resources within house to get those things done but the other time there was an aha moment that um, all these applications require dynamic exchange with RCCMS and we knew that but now we were really seeing it we were playing I mean just as you said in the last two weeks um, objects that education interpreted um, you know there 
the example of the um, miniatures. They um, did the interpretation of the actual cabinet that holds all the miniatures, but the cabinet's not an accession object. So, at, you know, at the ninth hour, what we, you know, what, how are we going to make that work, and how do we make it work so that our information is still standard, and how do we, when that goes offline, or an, another um, a miniature inside that is, changes, what that happens a lot, you know, how would we handle that? And those things were coming up unbelievably so. At the same time, the wall, we have user test rating, and we have cure curators coming down and looking at it and they were all of a sudden seeing especially with those cover flows that you saw that you can choose which direction you're going because the object of that is sort of that you start at um, impressionism and you end in like African art maybe like you, you're dwelling deeper into our collection they realize oh it's really important that my collection have all the right information and in fact why don't we do this and I said we'd love to do that but your whole collection isn't isn't sorted that way or it doesn't have the information that way so that and then um, the collection online, a lot of the stuff that people want to do, we're, we're a research-based institution, and how we set up the, and how we wanted to search for that, that became exciting. We said, okay, we, we now realize that now everyone's going to, you visually, because even all our collection was now in this timeline, and we had a, sort of these sortable dates, and we had a, how we were going to make, how do we make that work? And now people got visually, okay, my data is going to be there so many different ways. And even these iPads were, the little web text, we call it web text, but the label that was online for our online collection, a lot of curators thought it was fine. Well, now that it, every single item comes up on this iPad, you see the image beautifully, you have that as the standard, if, even if it's not interpreted, they realize, oh, I want my collection to look beautiful too. So we have taken this moment to say, and also with all the future projects we're thinking about and next steps for the wall and the iPad, what else before, you know, in this ending part, do we want to make sure this is doing so it can accommodate where we're going? Um, and because this sort of visual, it just it really took the visual for the museum to see, to say, oh, wait, this is really important to us too. That's it. And yeah, and our, then you had your our last demo. visual is just, um, the museum's going to be completed. It's almost done and it's really beautiful um, this year. And then our, our worst slated for, um, this is just to give you one last, because that was a lot of just content. Um, so that, that was where it started. This is where it is now. As you can see over, what, this is sort of the center of the museum. They restored the whole old museum, but you walk through and the, the collection wall is where that glass doors are. And you come through this whole, in, there's more done now, the restaurants and all are open. And then you walk through all the galleries and they're also on this side. Um, and this is the CM work related spring 2013. So we can go on to phase two of all our other projects. <laughs> so we originally I said wanted to show you the whole system and how it worked, but we kind of realized in uh, September we were gonna stop a little, slow down, work, put our resources in one place. And so here we are sort of showing you where we are and where we and um, what we've learned. Did anybody have any questions? Sure. Jen, I just, um, I'm curious how you're taking existing object records and how they may or may not fit into the new workflows and the new database. Like, for example, you have an object accession five years ago. It's not going to have emails attached to it. Are you grandfathering any of the document management stuff into existing records, or are you just kind of starting new workflows with new yeah. I would say right now it's start with the new workflows and go, I guarantee you once again, once they start using them, kind of like with every database, oh, there's a place for me to put that information now. And we, we have some curators that are very anxious. Once they see the tech, the platform and technology, they, they immediately buy in and they want everything there. Um, they don't like gaps then. So, I, you know, all of these projects seem to really encourage people to do the kind of work that that they've been asked to do because it is, you know, the, it's an immediate gratification for them to see, oh, I can find all these documents and I don't have to be in my office by my file folder or ask my, you know, somebody else who's, when they they travel so much, they were very excited about this concept of browser-based. I can get to everything, all my documents without being on site, uh, without actually having to be on the VPN. So is there an initiative to go and say, we're going to start scanning everything in every file? No, but I'm going to tell you there probably will be a lot of interns doing that stuff at next year. <laughs>
I mean, there is a lot of stuff that's been scanned and used. I mean, but it's just in duplicates it's everywhere. It's not like associated I mean, just with the object. Definitely have an issue with with versioning with uh, things like exhibition checklists. Is a, a very that's why we're taking a little time thinking out the whole exhibitions process. We kind of could run through those first things. We already had them. And we knew how to build them. Uh, with exhibitions, we had a fairly good system, but the documentary collateral with an exhibition is huge, and nobody wants to lose it. So um, they'll be they'll be big players in the whole document management part. Uh, are you planning on sharing metadata between the CCMS and the dam? And if so, how are you going to replicate or synchronize the metadata? Right now, right now we um, refresh. So we right now it's a it's a goes a single direction goes from our collections management system through some refresh scripts out to the dam because our dam would you know the dam only gets a limited set of data. These projects are making us rethink that. So that's why there's one of these things that are a little bit slowing slowing down that the dam the dam right now s serves up everything to the web and to the app. Um, but it pulls the information from the collections management system. We wanted to go. We wanted what to are go. the requirement actually in this? Even before we hit these, is that it goes both ways, and so we are working with um, our um, dam system to. So we want the information to flow back both ways in the new system, and that's a requirement. And they're and they're working. We're working with them directly. That's why I said that's already an integration. They're already figuring out how they're what they have to change structurally to make that work. Are you aware of what do you use the spectrum standard when you design your model? Yeah, the spectrum the spectrum standard is document, UK documentary, yes, and that was that was looked at. But our workflows for business process are not really covered by the UK spectrum standard. So a lot of the workflows that we've built already were literally business process. What happens operationally? The document workflows we're getting there. That's we're starting to learn about that ourselves, and we are aware of the UK Spectrum standard. Our librarians have required right. that we do that. We include we include that along with about ten other standards that we're trying to implement. No, no just because in, in the, a lot of in that tunnel the work as well. Yes, so yeah, so right. Defining collection processes and workflow. Right. Um, can you say what the cost will be by the time the this project is finished, the software is finished? That was one thing. We ended up going um, with, so we ended up going, we did, we ended up going with a develop. it came down to two people and both of them were just developers that had not c currently built a CCMS, although um, it was interesting once we got going, I think a couple of the vendors came back to us and said, you know what, we, we actually want to, we, we actually do really want to bid on this in a different way. What we threw out there was, this is something that we think a lot of people need, and we're willing to set our business practices a little more standardized instead of customizing it completely, and then you could, um, you could then sell it to other museums. And so we said, we've done a lot of the upfront work, so we sort of posed it as, when you put, put your price out there, this is the, this is an option we want you to think about. And um, and it was funny because a lot of people did realize that they kept getting calls and stuff. That's why we got calls afterwards, and we had already gone with these other developers. But um, in the end, um, to be honest, it's going to be with the everything are probably about four hundred thousand, and it's all in house, and that it would be. No, no light. The other thing is we didn't want to have licensing every year. We have got as an institutional, we're really trying to get away from that. We spend a lot of money in our business processes and our libraries on licensing. Come up license. Um, regarding the the metadata flow between the NAMs and the uh, CCMS, one all the flow of both directions, or you know, how do you establish authority? Well, that yes. Yeah. We won't have it all go back and yeah. forth, just the what shared fields. Okay. And then, um, how are you handling uh, uh, presenting the documentation from email? How are, how are, how are we handling? Yeah, I mean, it, it emails and threaded uh, conversation, it, it usually lives in, in um, uh, email systems that we have uh, what? usually not very great limits on uh, storage, so are you reporting anything consistent? Are you 
we're, we're just sort of that's what that's one of the last things are how the doc, document management systems are exactly going to work but um, at a very basic label level is once an, uh, a discussion um, gets going back and forth that's about an object that it will be assigned sort of a even if it's not accession yet a number of some sort and then it can be easily will be attached to the object once it's all done so that it the, could be the, right the, the expectation is not in perpetuity this has to be very specific set of emails that are related to to the you know to the discovery the research of the object it's so not there'll just be a, it'll be a way any to use, email <laughs> and we we set it up with our um we're using a, sort of a microsoft platform um, for our document man it's going to be based on um sharepoint you know and that was sort of something that we weren't sure if we wanted to go there and everything, but as a document management system, this seemed like the, the best solution, and um, the developers came back with ideas that made this exciting, especially also because we're a Microsoft Office and that we use Outlook, and these were easy ways to get alerts and also then to take these, these this information and easily assign something to it and, and it would move to the system. But in terms of the, the full archiving and archiving rules, like I said, our archivist is on there, and we are, I think, doing also research on archive systems right, right. now, too. So, so a lot of decisions are going to be made within the institution itself on document retention. Once again, with artworks, pretty yeah, much every document is retained forever. <laughs> but, you know, those decisions will be made. And um, I'm curious how you handle rights and reproductions and what kind of a workflow they use. Um, or whether you just work kind of trying to determine um, we in my opinion, it seems that our AM system handles their workflow a lot easier than our collections management system handles their workflow. And that would be the, the main way that our AM system will be pushing information into the collection system, but where the collection system is going to be the main authority for almost everything, pretty, pretty much everything else. But I think we're going to set up red and reproductions to the AM system and have that information for that. So that's a little bit of a complicated issue for us because we have a collecting library, uh -huh. and one of the things that you get with rights and reproductions are free books. So we have that is I can give you the workflow. I'll give you all the swim lanes, <laughs> but they do their whole acquis the library acquisition process. That was one that we had. There was a collaboration point that nobody thought of, but yeah. They're acquiring the books. There was contracts literally being sent via, you know, snail mail back and forth between the departments saying, "Go after this book." So that's definitely something that they they wanted to um, get straight. I think that will continue to be managed. I, I can understand the case for managing it through your dam. Uh, I don't think that will happen for us simply because it also builds the bibliography of the object at the same time, and we would like that to be as dynamic and. When the library has secured the book and they check it in and they have a thing that goes straight into the bibliographic record on their work of art. So, um, and we also all goes dealing, out with the rights There is or the, the, the unknown place that we've been going, and especially on all these projects, sort of digital rights and how that will change. And, so, right. and that's sort of, so I see where you're, you're going, but it's still, I think. It's a problem that we're, that we're discussing and we're kind of in the middle of, we go back and forth and back and forth, and it's just, it would be nice to see how you're doing you know, Sure, I can send you that. Are you guys using Office 365? Are you guys integrating? No. I don't think that was in the. No, aspect. that's not in the. But we—that's still as of these last things that we sort of took a hold to go finish other projects. That was, we also realized how we wanted to do document. We hadn't. <coughs> we haven't really gone completely how we're doing all those parts of it. So, in fact, we had to. We have a some synchronization concerns another one of the things that we're thinking about is they were building on um, 2010 and we're all in, in 08 and that if we all switch first of all there's the expense but other applications will break <laughs> so we are there they're now reverse engineering a little bit back to make sure that we can that that it's that it'll work on both so, so that may have just assist, but for the descriptive cataloging is there one set data model you said that African art might have a different view. Then is that just views on one shared data model, or can they have value pairs for department? Well, it's one data model, and it's CDWA based. So the schema is there. We have some customization to it, and not in terms of changing things or reappropriating, but we've probably added a few fields and various tables to make sure that it accommodates some things that we have locally. Um, when 
when the curator said their core data, it was, we all have to say artists, we all have to say date, we all have to say these, and I think they came up with about 15 fields. Um, but then obviously with prints, they have to say, you know, state edition. So that's not gonna happen, it's not. It's data that doesn't exist for paintings, but a print isn't cataloged until you tell, you, you add that information. Um, I could, that's just one example. So they all have sure. these things they have to share in the data model, once again, so that we know what we can do with collections of all. Uh, but then we can also then know, well, this curator has committed to these other fields, so what kinds of things can we do with those other fields for that collection in terms of interpretation? But the data model does not change from one collection to the other. The site will, so their interface to it may be customized based on their department, but not the data model itself. The architecture behind is the same. Yes. Yes. They agreed. We actually came up with a hierarchy of authorities as yeah. well. What is the hierarchy? <laughs> uh, I mean, data governance, and it started. It's the Getty. If we have it, if it's if it there, the the um, if it's not in the in ULAN, then There's next like thing, more. then the locally, you know, and then we have locally controlled at the bottom, uh, and. That implementation is, is interesting to look at right now. Once again, UI revealed that showing five different authority files in a results list gets a little confusing for users. So um, it's there. It just needs, you know, these interface things when people actually start doing the work and start doing the cataloging, you went, wait, now we got to think out exactly how we want this to work in real time. Theoretically, it works. <laughs> From a developer standpoint, it works, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the, the catalogers ask for something that they're now not regretting. The, the team that you have built in this includes two developers. Do you have any interface designer? Yeah, no, we ha it, um, it's a team of, uh, it was, uh, it's, well now it's like one developer, right? It's a team, they, well we have different, the document, there's SharePoint, then there's another developer, there's architect, and then we had project manager, and we did require, that was one of the, the one we went with, we thought their interface design wasn't as nice, so we required them to have a designer. Um, and that's something actually we've been working, when we did the testing results, we realized we needed to work on our interface design a little bit more. So they're, yeah, it's con it's contracted with a company and they, they are subcontracting the, the SharePoint part, the, literally the, the workflows, because that's not their area of expertise. The architecture behind is not being done by the SharePoint right. people, and we were kind of warned about that. Are you tying the software life cycle with SharePoint's life cycle? Are you keep the provisions of the software tied to the Oh, so the customization of SharePoint to do these workflows? It will be it will be architected to to manage with those things, and that that's one thing we're confident with this developer is that they will not build something that can't move along with the product that they've proposed that we use. That <laughs> there is a lot of skepticism I mean, we, about SharePoint for this. I mean, and that that, that is out there. It's a great document no, management. No, but we but. we put a lot of very detailed requirements before we went with that um, solution. So. Is that it? Thank you very much Thank you. for...